13? 13. 13. Uh, okay, year, uh, welcome uh, everybody to year 24, season 47, episode 13 of KGB Monday Night Poetry. And uh, I'll pass it over to Jason. All right, so um, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce um, Jennifer Knox. And um, I have a long introduction about, about when we first met, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna shorten that slightly and just include the part where our, my first words to her were, you're really a drag queen. Mm -hmm. And her first words to me, which involved a <laughs> plate of french fries and gravy. Um, and we were, this was a long time ago. And she said to me, um, and, and it, it endeared me to her forever. Um, your metabolism is going to change. <laughs> I want to be there to watch it. And, and, and you have been, you, you've been here for me. So um, here's the thing. Um, so. So um, Jen, Jennifer L. Knox has one of the most distinctive voices in American poetry, um, noted for her celebrations of the absurd and her wickedly funny sense of humor. But there's a thing that you need to know about Jen's work that you don't. Um, everyone considers her a surrealist, a kind of neo-Dadaist, a one-person imagination factory who can supply our unconscious with all the material that we need to work out our deepest fears and kinks. But Jen's work is far more literal than anyone realizes. There's a story about Saul Steinberg in which he was supposed to use dynamite to take down a tree. But when he set off the explosives, the tree flew vertically into the air and blew out a crater where the roots had been. And the tree landed exactly where it had started, but now it was five feet shorter. And when Saul Steinberg drew a cartoon of this, of course he was hailed as having a charming and whimsical sensibility when in fact he was simply drawing what had happened. Um, Jen, like me, uh, spent some of our time together in graduate school uh, learning how to be misunderstood, um, how to predict what people will hear when you are simply telling them your own experiences. And Jen, like me, lives in a world that is a bit askew, not by our own design, but that we inhabit by some quirk of personality, some accident of birth, and some magnetic pull that we, inhab um, that we exert on the unexpected. For example, in the invitation email that you received to tonight's reading, that Thanksgiving dinner happened. All of those characters are real. And while I was not at that particular Thanksgiving dinner, Jim, um, who you read about in the poem, carried me out of numerous parties where I had a great deal to drink. And the um, ping pong paddle, I remember quite well, though I was generally a minor player in the economy of butt paddling that frequently concluded parties. Um, Jen often holds her cards close to her vest. I'm not sure you could know without knowing Jennifer that her poem, Waiting on the Ambulance, is the monologue that her friend Meredith believed she was delivering after a car accident. But as her jaw had been severed from her face, she was just spurting blood and only later found out that she had been unable to speak. And this is what I mean when I say that when you read Jennifer Knox's work, remember that its attachment is not only to the surreal, but to the real. And that the humanism of her work is often attached to the parts of humanity we want not to see, but really shouldn't ignore. Jennifer L. Knox is a sublime poet, an eco-poet, a funny poet, a profound poet, and a poet with whom I and my own work has been in conversation for more than two decades. Um, Jennifer Knox's fifth book of poems, Crushing It, was published by Copper Canyon Press in October 2020. Her poems have appeared five times in Best American Poetry and in publications such as the New York Times, the New Yorker, and American Poetry Review. Her nonfiction writing has appeared in the New York Times and the Washington Post from 2016 to 2017. She developed and curated the crowdsourced poetry project, Iowa Bird of Mouth, which was supported by the Iowa Arts Council and the National Endowment for the Arts. Over 750 people from around the world contributed to the project. Jennifer teaches at Iowa State University and is an ongoing and teaches an ongoing series of private creative writing courses. She is the co-proprietor of a small spice company called Salt Liquors, which I highly recommend. And we're not going to welcome um, Jennifer right now. We're actually gonna go right into Jada's introduction of Natalie Shapiro. And then Natalie and Jennifer are going to read back and forth. Ooh. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. What instantly pulled me into Natalie Shapiro's orbit of poetry was her casual yet sharp voice. Her narrators and subjects bite and shine with wit and nuance. 
Her poetry provides an eclectic array of topics that she sinks deeply into while never losing her signature voice and power. Her sneers, laughs, and revels in the face of death, God, and motherhood, as long as well as other things. Shapiro's ability to make her all her own made to being put that never Sorry for my background, it's a little loud. But Natalie Shapiro is the author, most recently of poetry collection, Popular Longing. Her previous collections are Hard Child, shortlisted for the International Griffin Poetry Prize, and No Object, winner of the Great Lakes College Association New Writers Award. Natalie's writing has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Review of Books, The Paris Review, The New York Times Magazine, and elsewhere. She is the professor She's the professor, sorry, she's professor of the practice of poetry at Tufts University, and she has previously worked as a civil rights lawyer and as a literary editor. She lives in Massachusetts. Welcome, Natalie Shapiro. Natalie, do you want to go first or should I go first? Do it. All right. Uh, I live in central Iowa, and this is a true poem about one night when my husband and I went out to see a Black Sabbath tribute band, and it's called Wolverine Season. Oh, honey, are you okay? I asked the woman in the bathroom, soaking wet as if she just emerged from the shower. Yeah. Maybe a little too much rum on an empty stomach. She wiped her mouth with her hand and left. In the sink, waxy red flecks of lipstick. That woman over there just puked up lipstick in the bathroom. I yelled in my friend's ear over the Black Sabbath tribute band. Write a poem about that, she yelled back and smiled. We were up late for a school night. It was all part of the new regimen. The documentary I'd just seen about death said rocking out is actually good for you. And rocking out to Sabbath, dude, we were gonna live like forever on the bones other animals passed up. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is really, the this is awesome. Thanks for thanks for having us and thanks everyone to be here. Um, this this is called My Hair is My Thing. The symphony is out of money again, and no wonder. All those violins, the twisted strands and sponges. Who could not think of torture? Last week I read a novel about a man so awful that when he died, I wept because it was fiction. I wanted it to be real so I could watch him really die. And I wanted you to die also and to be feted with a lengthy organza filled funeral so that I could make a big show of blowing it off. I decided to go out and get a tattoo of your funeral with me not there, but apparently it's illegal here to tattoo a person who's crying. The trend now is to be interred with beloved possessions, pearl trim gun, gold watch, whatever you got. Some people recoil at the waste of it, but not me. These contuse little objects of wealth, they're disgusting. I just pray we have earth and shovels enough. I pray we have bodies enough to bury them all. Um, yes, thank you for saying, thank you for having us, Natalie. I forgot to do that. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having us. I'm so excited about this. Um, and since Natalie just read a poem about there's some death in there, I'm going to read one too. This is called Irwin Allen versus the Lion Tamer. Irwin Allen was a director, they called him the master of disaster. He was very popular in the 60s. He did the Poseidon Adventure, the Towering Inferno, and, uh, and, uh, so I find, I've been trying to put together Irwin Allen and a lion tamer for a long time. So this is the poem. Irwin Allen versus the lion tamer. We used to love lion tamers because people really didn't know who would win in a battle of man versus nature. Back then, all the stories ended in death, our death, by mauling or snake bite or dog bite 
or being struck by lightning, smothered by an avalanche, charged off a cliff, carried away in the talons of an eagle, inhaled by a whale, stung by a scorpion, swarmed by killer bees, gored by a rhino, poisoned by berries, pricked by a sticker, swallowed by quicksand, beguiled by a black cat, gobbled up by a witch. So imagine the relief with one flick of the whip and an up, the skulking lion stands on legs like a human. It's toothy protest, no big thing. After all those years of fear, I'd laugh at it too. And that's what people did until there were no more lions to laugh at. But Erwin Allen knew death doesn't live in a thing you could kill with a gun. It's not the heat, it's the hubris. The fire that wipes the city out begins in birthday candles and the happy huff behind them. The storm that flips the cruise ship starts in the sea that rises up to fill the empty sky. An airplane crash begins, not in birds, but in feeders we've stolen the seed from. Certain, nobody can see us. Yeah, we could probably probably go back, just go back and forth about death all night. Hey, I, I'm free. <laughs> uh, this one was called Have At It. When you work here for 10 years, you get a blanket. The blanket has their name on it, not yours. <laughs> I am conducting an anecdotal study of longtime employees, and I have yet to find one person who uses the thing to keep warm. M reported placing it between her children and the dirt before they all sat down to a meal outside. S recounted how she'd wrestled it out of a half stuffed bureau drawer to wrap her beagle's body after he died. She buried that dog herself in her bloomless little side yard and registered embarrassment when the meter reader caught her there and toning over the body with a hymnal. But why should she be embarrassed? It certainly can't be beneath us to bless our animal dead when all our scientists do all day is endeavor to prove that great apes mourn, that houseflies mourn, that elephants mourn, that when a fiddle leaf ficus succumbs another ficus keens in its earthenware. We would like to confirm that everyone is recognized in death, unseen as we are in this life. That's all we have. Do you have all of these memorized or are you reading them off of something? No, I, I, I memorized them. Really? <laughs> yeah, I, it's, it doesn't really read on <laughs> Zoom. <laughs> well, uh, wow, okay. I hold the book just in, to kind of funnel it yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah, you don't yeah. you don't have them memorized. I can't. I mean, I hold the closed book. I can't do it without holding the closed. Book. I under, I I kind of understand. Um, so when you said yes, I've memorized them. My bladder just instantly filled up. It was like magic. Like holy. Uh, uh, so this one's. I have none of mine memorized. This is called Home is Where the Mushrooms Grow. And I have a lot of poems in this book with dialogue in them. And if I'm not careful, it's like I'm putting on a little puppet show with myself. So this is one of them. Home is Where the Mushrooms Grow. A sudden spotlight floods the black empty stage. How long have we been sitting here? Are you next to me still you? Funny how the dark can make you feel alone, even though people are all around you and feel bad, like you did something dumb. A person in a panda costume steps from the wings, strolls center stage and pulls a cherry from its pocket. This is a paycheck, it declares, the voice within the head muffled by fake fur and plastic. Bullshit, you whisper in my ear. Whisper, because I can tell you're afraid the panda will hear you. Maybe I should be afraid too, but all I feel is bad because the panda thinks I'm dumb enough to believe its lies. Hey, maybe it's right. We're not making a move to kill it as pandas are highly endangered. 
Maybe we should try making babies with it. I read somewhere that next to diamonds, pandas are the hardest thing to make on earth. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, here, I'll put the book in the, I'll put it partially in the frame. You, and, and not to make me feel better. You don't have to. I can, I can deal with it. It's just so badass. Uh, no, it's, it's, um, it's, it, I, I would really prefer not to. Not to have done, not, not to have memorized them. Not to know these. I would prefer never to have heard these. Um, this poem is called California. We often ate late by flameless candles and took turns choosing how best to be disposed of. I want to be buried. I want everyone to be buried. I realize there's scarcely a spare acre left in the ground, but I just can't do without the indecorous transit from parlor to plot. I need that array of daytime headlights jolting the arid access road, the only remembrance that matters. Don't make a speech. For years, I would wonder whether the man who attacked me in his memory did the event of it persist as a dull sort of flash. And then he died and became himself just a flash in the mind of the world. And now I wonder, is he anywhere? I don't believe in hell. And also I don't believe in nothing. So that leaves only heaven. I have a couple questions. It is my understanding that the weather in heaven has only a single setting, which is pleasant. I haven't spent real time in California, but friends of mine who've moved there say it's difficult absent the changing of the seasons to remember when things took place. With reference to always the lodgepole pine and the low bent needle grass, you get confused. Dates, sequences, even the people involved. You can almost imagine the whole thing with somebody else. So we're on to California death now? Please. I'm with you. California hobo insurance. California hobo insurance contains 500,000 pages on the ineligibility of lottery winners. But keep reading because Golden Yosemite and all its opportunities to disappear without a trace and have yourself declared legally dead lies on the other side where redwoods reek of briny formaldehyde. You know that old kid song about John Muir marrying a tree? Fun fact, in the 1909 version, he poops in all the park's trash cans and the rangers beat his ass till he's brain damaged. But trail signs suggest that Muir had authorization. Here's the plaque rangers planted with his name in the grass, misspelled. So if you're traveling through Yosemite, roll down the window. Some of us are disappearing on purpose. There's a winking emoji at the end. Should I try and act that out? Probably not. <laughs> a space to train and exit. Maybe, California is just plain easier with the commonness of outbuildings. Raw looking cedar, sheet metal walls and a runnel of sun getting in through the roof seam. Position the heavy bag, tighten the eye bolt, 25 right hooks, or pull up a chair and compose your suicide note, a space to train and exit. The purpose of having a body at all is to practice to practice the keeping alive of domestic animals and of plants. You dispense to yourself some minerals and some water. You expose yourself to the sun and it helps you remember to do the same for those in your charge. If you could equip them with all they require or else make it so they require nothing, you would not need your body at all. Bodyless. Old women talking about death. 
Why did I become one of them? Wait, old women talking about death. When did I become one of them? I used to roll my eyes at their gory stories. EMTs found a neighbor at the bottom of her basement steps, a head to toe hematoma. Use a cane, I told her, shrugs. Grandma and the great aunts itemized her injuries. Poor dear, how long till she was found? They told their stories picnicking atop our people at the cemetery, atop all the men in our family who died young. The rest, disappeared shrugs so no stories for them these days when i call Kay, she tells me about her friends who are dying or have died since we last spoke and i feel closer to her an adult yesterday jay filled me in on m's cancer she whispered it's bad i leaned forward M's doctors removed her necrotic uterus through her abdomen in two jammy black hunks because her insides had decayed into a sarcomatous tar pit. Then her incision dehissed. I cocked my head. She made a starburst motion over her belly button. Ah, I've heard that happens with cancer, I said. Grateful Z described the process to me after her stepmother died. Now, I even have a name for that indignity. Thank God. I hate surprises. Fifty. He said... If you keep punishing yourself like this, you'll be old by the time you're 50. And right there, in the instant of him saying it, I became 50 and I was never able to go back. And it was never made clear to me what might have transpired in the obliterated years between. Had I performed myself inside them exceedingly quickly or had I not lived them at all? I felt as though I had memories, a deaccession painting, a hovel with keyhole doorframe, anecdotes of conglomerates and their cocktail napkin origins, was I supposed to be charmed? Hardest of all was the recentness of every egregious outburst, the adjacency I could not wish away. I was 50 and my worst mistakes I'd made yesterday. Monochrome rainbows. I used to worry a lot about money and think about killing myself too, but today I'm rich, all because I took an enormous pill that made me a financial genius. And now I know how to do all sorts of money things, like a pro, but better than a pro, a queen. Speculate on futures, for example, and manage risk. Very lucrative stuff. Did you know if you Google APR, you get stuff on the annual percentage rate, not American Poetry Review? Well, I know now, and I can make the most incredible spreadsheet when I push the mystery button, which is no longer a mystery to me, money shoots out of it. And then money shoots out of my eyes, which no longer see color other than green, but bees do that too, right? And they seem happy enough in their heavy bodies. Green. I saw an image of Cleopatra being delivered to Caesar in a rolled up rug, just like falling from the rug. And at work, I began to be worried that others, and especially those in supervisory roles, viewed me as green, temperamentally inexpert. I tried wearing crisper shirts, but it did not help. So of course, when all my friends began to die, I found at last a means of proving myself through indifference to their passing. I refrained from sharing remembrances. That time we pulled B's ruined tooth or when Elle and I hiked out to the obverse side of the Hollywood sign. When colleagues sought to console me, I offered only the stoic rejoinder, 
death is a part of life. I underwent my yearly performance assessment and was prompted to name a task at which I excelled. I said, truly knowing that death is a part of life. And when I was then asked to articulate a plan for the coming year, I said, speaking louder when stating that death is a part of life and perhaps appending an amplifying gesture. I returned to my desk and removed my heels and capped my pen and called B's mom and told her about the tooth. She recounted for me his younger years, mud covered her up to his shoulders in the cold ocean. She said he had been ready to die, that through his suffering he'd sworn it several times. Though also he'd said several times that he was not ready. It was tough to know. This is dedicated to the one I love. We told ourselves we did it for the next room over in the Natural History Museum, the roped off one they'd been hammering on forever. But really, we did it for the money, for money's machinations that kept the crude, rude, and boiling. The money was born a baby with our face. Aww. We sang to it, and as it grew into a whirly gig of gas spouts, we sang louder splitting into harmonies like airshow jets, doo-wopping with our waists cinched in rubber bands to hit the inhumane high notes. We laughed about it at Mama Cass's backyard picnic. We laughed about everything. It was that kind of picnic. We were all really connected, you know? <sighs> Talking about the next shape clouds would shift into. This was back when the baby had our face, not our absences, our unwindings. Flowers would have killed you. The river is heavy with phosphorus and scum. It causes liver damage if ingested. I don't know exactly whose runoff it is, but so long as they're taking press photos with prize-winning children and donating sizable sums to the ballet, I take no issue. River's yours. Once I saw a guy trying to talk his way out of some base thing he'd done and his underwhelmed companion said to him, flowers would have killed you. Now I say it all the time. The councilman announces he's sorry for taking advantage of the district's trust or the paper issues the mother of all retractions. And I'm right there at the window, readying myself for the knock and the spray of Larkspur and T Rose. You shouldn't have. That was the first poem I read from the new book, Natalie. And um, when I, after I read it, I just wanted to walk around the house going whoop, whoop but um, more in a bird territorial way, not in a hooray, you know, like whoop, whoop, yep, yep. Yep, let's get her done. Sorry, can you do that bird noise one more time? Please? Whoop, 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 sure. The day after the fair, a drone discovered the sea of dead but the people back at HQ piloting the drone were dead too. Their bodies crumpled on a deep blue carpet. So the drone flew till its batteries ran out and plummeted into the endless undulating hills of dead people, pork chops on sticks, garbage. Some protein had come gunning for us and the spin out flung it everywhere. Efficient. It happened slowly over millions of years. It happened in an instant. The mushroom spores blown in to break down the plastic and people made it to the soundboard, tripped the loudspeakers and flooded the dead world with the band singing when I paint my masterpiece, which the mushrooms loved and learned to sing just like Levon. The spores memorized all the songs and books and pictures. They thought these were lists of things we wanted bad, but never got. Yeah, it's getting, it's getting garbagey. I'm loving it. Yeah, yeah. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> uh, 
stoop. All I can think when I catch the dog out by the stoop with a rat in her mouth is I thought it would never happen to me. That's what the rat I say to myself must be saying. Having surely borne witness to how many other rats gnawed on by how many herders and hounds and yet fancying all that time herself immune. And don't get her started on the thorniest part, how the fact that it happened so often means her misery is nothing special, how the moment of her truest trauma is also the pinnacle of her own commonness and it's juvenile to cry for the everyday. So get over yourself, I say to the rat who squeaks each time the dog bites down, sounding just like one of those chew toys, which I suddenly understand are made to make the noise of something getting killed. <laughs> Okay. How much time do we have? More. More? Uh, this is for my aunt Marilyn. Marilyn, every day we wonder. Marilyn, every day we wonder what you'd think about all this. I imagine you crashing through the inaugural barricades or flying a stolen helicopter into a wildfire with a margarita gripped between your knees. Remember, gridlocked on the five, you winked at the bearded dude leaning on the asphalt roller. I'd only seen women wink at men in movies. And he leered, I'm like, you laid. And you drawled, why don't you get that piece of shit out of the road? Shock splashed across his face. Lock the doors, crazy bitch, he roared and punched our hood, clueless how close he was to getting his ass shot. We found the loaded gun under your mattress, Smith and Wesson, cowgirl style, swirly pearl handle, and the serial number filed off. We like to take it out at parties. What a cute gun. We also found several transistor radios and a box of old weed. Cheers, auntie. With one phone call, you scared my scary Brooklyn landlord into fixing my deadbolt. You were six states away and a 72 year old woman. There's a pack of kids down the street in a house that's falling apart. We never see an adult, no matter how cold or dark it is, they're always playing outside with a new puppy. We have no idea where the old puppies have gone, but if you were here, we know there'd be no more of this new puppy bullshit. Teacup this. To my young daughter, I sing the songs my mother sang to me, which is to say to my young daughter, I sing an eclectic selection of breakup tunes of the 60s and 70s. I should have known you'd bid me farewell. There's a lesson to be learned in this and I learned it very well. Now I know you're not the only starfish in the sea. If I never hear your name again, it's all the same to me. That does not seem right to sing to a baby. Yet here I am. And here she is, bed sprawled, unblessed, and so perhaps like a starfish. Yes, one creature of more than the world requires. As I am unceasingly reminded by pamphlet mandates, blanket labels, alerts to lay her always up. It's awful to be a person. That's why from my lovers, I've always demanded to know what kind of a dog I might be, were I ever a dog? And don't say teacup this, toy that. Don't pick a dog that must travel all over stuffed in a bag like a filthy magazine. Don't take it lightly when I say, of all the men I've been with, there are only a few I never would allow to hold my child. I consider this a triumph. I was going to say some, oh, 
I don't have any kids that I know of. Pretty. A head taller, but a year younger than my girlfriends with their bouncy boobs and full blown rose bushes. They knew how to squeeze into tight, white zip around jeans without getting their pubes snagged in the metal teeth, clenched from tag to belly button. You couldn't wear underwear with those things. My tight white jeans were too short and gave me a camel toe. My clit popped like a knuckle against the seam. In skates, I was even taller, hunched, mouth agape or talking shit, squinting, always this close to falling, flailing, arms out, neck deep in an incoming tide. I couldn't skate sideways or backwards or even fast. So when the lights dimmed and the disco ball lit up and the boy on black skates, the slick kind you couldn't rent at the rink with the red toe stops rolled up and held out his hand, I... He's asking you to skate. My girlfriend said, duh, dumbass, hot another hard as she pushed me from behind. I took his hand and he gently, in a way that showed he knew I didn't know how to skate, led me into the current. Nobody gets too much heaven by the Bee Gees. I looked down at my flabby little tits, all nipple, not at the boy with blonde hair I'd seen at the rink before skating for hours, backwards, jumps, but always alone. I felt sorry for him until I looked up and realized he was much older than me and all the other kids at the rink. The song ended. He asked me to skate again, and I said, no, I'm tired, but thought, you must think I'm pretty fucking stupid which is exactly the same thing i think now whenever a stranger holds out his hand to me do we finish it with one more or that'd be perfect yeah I'm yeah okay perfect. one more I think we should really just take the gloves off on this one. Now. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, man at his bath. Six years ago, the big museum sold eight famous paintings to purchase for unspecified millions Gustav Kalabat's Man at His Bath. Now it's hip to have a print of it. And whenever I see one hung for decoration, I'm almost certain that this is what Calabot had in mind when he broke out the oils in 1884. Some 21st century bitch in Boston catching a glimpse of a framed reproduction and recollecting a study about how washing oneself may induce a sense of culpability. What I remember is he insisted I clean before leaving. That, and he was trying to be dreamlike. He took my jaw in his hand and said, in the next life, we'll really be together. And the clamp in his voice made me almost certain he knew something I did not. So now I eat right, train hard, get my shots. This life, I'm angling to remain in this life as long as I can, being almost certain as I am was after. Jen, train take us home. Train as hard as you can. Um, this one's called facelift and it's about divorce facelift i met the woman whom i hadn't seen in years at a bar with many happy friends around her i could tell right away she was different flushed as a flower showing more leg and what legs smiling with her teeth apart breathless as if she'd just run her first marathon and someone kind had thrown a shiny silver blanket over her shoulders I'm getting a divorce, she said, tugging down the corners of her grin like a too short skirt. It's a hard time, she looked away. But a little exciting, right? I asked, remembering the relief, not knowing what would happen next, but knowing what would never again. My begging to be loved the way I thought I could 
but had no proof. What he said didn't exist, did. I was all the proof I needed. Oh my God, I'm, I'm unmuting. I'm, everyone can now, you can unmute yourselves so you can clap, everyone can. Everyone now has oh, the power to mute. I'm not oh, muted. Oh, that was amazing. Hey. Hey. Wow. That was oh, really, God, yeah. That was. Magical. That was I, I think we need juggling pins, Natalie, like, like uh, the fabulous uh, fish, Fishman Brothers or something. I'm, I'm very clumsy. Oh, me too. <laughs> Completely unbalanced. Fell over the other day at yoga. Just right onto the thing. I think you guys. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was interrupting Jennifer from my accident earlier. Um, I was saying that I think the back and forth made it more enticing. It was like a really interesting ping pong match. And I love that like some of your poems kind of just match the similar vibes. Thank you for that. It was fine. <laughs> that was amazing. It only works when, when the two poets really resonate against each other. Yeah, um, I, I was, I remember, um, what was the who? Uh, we're David still Lehman recording, and, so don't say who it was. When we stopped yeah. recording, I'll say who it was who did that. And it was just a disaster. It was just the worst. Oh, not that one. Yeah, so oh no, awful. I forgot about that one. Yeah, that's not the one I'm thinking of. I'm just but um, it, it, for, at times you guys were almost like, it was sort of a, uh, there was qualities of like a battle rap or something, but in the fact that, but you seem to be working on the same team, but it was still like passing it back and forth, like, like top that. I don't know, it was really great. Like, uh, it was very entertaining. Yeah. I, I, it was I, like every I every noun that you have in your poems, Natalie. I'm like, I have that noun somewhere. Yeah. Like you have a little swirly pearl handled gun, right? Yeah. I was like, I got that gun somewhere. Where's that gun? <laughs> don't don't like the, uh, the, the, the dueling the dueling poems, dueling poets format. <laughs> <laughs> it was though kind of like then, oh, I have that toy. You know? <laughs> and it's just like, here's what I, I did with it. Yeah. You know, here's my little kind of uh, the, the little play world of this particular poem where it figures. I, I mean, it was, I mean, so, it was, so and uh, Natalie, the fact that you have your poems memorized is wow. is crazy. Uh, we is had a, we had an incredible story uh, from the Fran Quinn Terrence Hayes night, and Fran was telling a story about Etheridge Knight's first reading in Worcester, Massachusetts, and uh, and he was he was reading oh I forget with whom, and he was so drunk that they had to like wake him up to read, and uh, and you know and then he, on his way up to the platform he even then fell on his face, but then he he got up and he pulled himself up on the lectern. And, and then he just went into all of his poems and they all came out, they were all memorized. And- Awesome. You, what's that? Awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. And uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I feel like that's some ancient shit. Well, are you <laughs> saying Natalie can get uh, I, just completely shit hammered uh, and like the terror for her own living space. I you think could experiment with this. person who could ever, you know, kind of earn the Etheridge Knight trophy. Oh, <laughs> I didn't know there was one of those. <laughs> just a damn one. I'm going to interrupt to do some fundraising before we start losing people. Um, because as you know, we do come to you from KGB and it's a bar and bars make money by selling drinks to people. And um, that's not happening. So, and, and KGB has, has had some really rough times. The um, ice machine melted, the ice machine stopped working really early in the pandemic, flooding the entire establishment um, they've been broken into. Um, and so even now we kind of have like a trickle of people moving back into bars. Um, it's still really important that if we want KGB to be there for us, um, when we're ready to go back in, that we really contribute. Um, and so whatever you would have spent on a drink tonight, whatever you might have, you know, tipped the bartender, you can make that contribution through this Fundly website. We're also a little bit competitive. And so when you do it, you get to like, say how much you enjoyed um, the uh, KGB bar. And like, you can say nice things about um, me and Matt and John and Jada. 
and increase the longevity of our, our 27 year series. Um, and you get different levels. So you can like give at the, you can, you can give whatever you want. I mean, if you want to make a $4 donation, that's fine. Uh, you can give a $15 graduation at, uh, donation and be a grad student with two drinks waiting for you um, and a $4 tip to the employees right now. And then it goes all the way up to um, the $50,000 patron. And we keep waiting for someone to donate the $50,000 you get a forty-five thousand dollar bar tab. Like that doesn't yeah. happen if you if you contribute to NPR. Like if you contribute mm -hmm. to NPR, they give you like a tote bag. You get like a mug or something. Like no, if you contribute, to support you get a PGB, blanket with their name on it. Yeah, <laughs> you, get, <laughs> you get a forty-five thousand dollar bar tab. And like how how great would that be? We should do the math sometime this summer, Jason. Like how long it would take to fill that tab out because. If you're spending fifty thousand dollars on on a forty five thousand dollar bar tab, you really are like that's a know, that's kind yeah. of a personal question, don't you think? How long <laughs> it is, is it going to take <laughs> well, you to finish that bar tab? It's it personal in a number of ways because it's like I'll, like how many friends do you have? You know? <laughs> like, oh, I didn't um, know whether, you could bring yeah. friends. All right. uh, it's your tab. It's your tab. Yeah, you can. So you could always just be the most popular person in the city for about two months. It'd be like those people you hear about win the lottery, rent out a whole hotel, and then it broke again, and you know three weeks pull that but somebody will probably do it right jason yeah i i don't think having a forty-five thousand dollar bar tab is actually a really good idea for anyone like no. there's no one who i who i look at and think you know what you need a forty-five thousand dollar bar tab like that's that's just it is a recipe for disaster but it would be a really fun disaster at until, the beginning. <laughs> until the fun stops. Until the fun yeah. stops. And Jen, I was going to say, you you used to, like, when when you were more positioned in SLAM, like, you had your poems memorized that, that you you did. What you could recite the condiment, condiment rack in my car from memory. That there was, like, a whole other universe of the 90s. I don't where remember that at all, Jason. It was it was just part of a different scene. <laughs> yeah, like, I, like, in the scene we ended up in, like, that wasn't really a thing people did. But the scene you were coming out of, like, you, you had swaths of poems memorized did i gosh uh, I'll, I'll take your word for it uh i'm i'm amazed i'm amazed that natalie can do it because it's so complex but i guess if you if you write it it doesn't seem that complex no it's not i'm telling you it's not good it's very unpleasant <laughs> which one the memorizing or the, or just the, writing, it, or the uh, like just to have, it have other things in your head <laughs> uh. the delivery the delivery is fantastic uh, no, this is you're like, so wonderful this is such a like this is a really really fun reading and so rad it's like so rad to to read with jen and um mm -hmm. and it's really like this is a, a great vibe it's uh Thanks for having us. <laughs> yes, thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you guys. I, I, one of the cool things about listening to you read too was the weird sense of excitement you had. I feel like if like Natalie finishes a poem, she seems excited to hear Jen's poem and then vice versa. It was like this sort of, uh, there was an energy that kept it going. I, we have a comment in the chat from Jada saying that she loved that back and forth thing too. Um, uh, you know, th that kind of thing, it's kind of difficult to pull off. We've seen it before. You guys really. Wait, awesome I'm, I'm going to stop the recording. Yeah.